I hope everybody's had a good week. This particular sutta is one that I like very much because it, it spells out the different stages that happen during the time of the Buddha. It's a different stages for monks and what they are striving to attain. So, thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Rajagaha on the mountain Vulture Peak. It was soon after Devadatta had left. They're referring to their Devadatta, the Blessed One, addressed the monks thus. Monks, here some clansmen go forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, considering I am a victim of birth, aging, and death, of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. I'm a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. When he has gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor, and renown. He is pleased with gain, honor, and renown, and his intention is fulfilled. That's what happened to Devadatta. And there are some monks that that's all they're interested in is becoming popular. To me, that's a very low course of action and it feeds the ego. So you don't get as good a teaching from somebody that's just looking for gain and honor and renown. On account of which he lauds himself and disparages others. I have gained honor and renown, but these other monks are unknown, of no account. He becomes intoxicated with gain, honor, and renown, grows negligent, falls into negligent, and being neg negligent, he lives in suffering. Suppose a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, came to a great tree standing possessed of heartwood, passing over its heartwood, its sapwood, its inner bark, its outer bark. He would cut off its twigs and leaves and take them away, thinking they were heartwood. Then a man with good sight, seeing him, might say, This good man did not know the heartwood, the sapwood, the inner bark, the outer bark, or the twigs and leaves. Thus, while needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, he came to a great tree, standing possessed of heartwood, passing over its heartwood, its sapwood, its inner bark and outer bark. He cut off the twigs and leaves and took them away, thinking they were heartwood. Whatever it was this good man had to make with heartwood, his purpose will not be served. So too, monks, some clansmen go forth out of faith, but they still live in suffering. This monk is called one who has taken the twigs and leaves of the holy life and stopped short of that. Here, some clansmen go forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, considering I'm a victim of birth, aging, and death, of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. I'm a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. 
surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. In, in my experience of being a monk for 35 years and uh, practicing meditation a few years before that, I came to the realization that the reason that I started looking for meditation at all was I was suffering. I was suffering a lot. I got heavy into depression and I was looking for a way out. And all of, all of the people that I've ever talked to about Buddhism, that was their goal. That was the, ori the origination of the start of the practice. Now you have to have some curiosity to start looking. But the pain was, in my case, the pain was so great, I had to find some way out of it or I was going to commit suicide. I, I, hadn't, com I hadn't thought about suicide quite yet, but I knew that I was heading that way. I think all of you have experienced something like that at the start of your practice. You were unsatisfied with what life was presenting itself with and there was a lot of suffering and trying to get out of suffering. Um, in in uh, America, when I first started, that was uh, in the mid-70s, that's when there was a lot of... Uh, Oh, magic mushrooms and LSD and, and a lot of pot and things like that that people were taking so that they wouldn't experience so much suffering. Now, I, I have run across some people that come here and do a retreat and then when they get off retreat, they immediately light up a joint, not understanding that they are hurting themselves more than they're helping. When you take the precepts, be serious about it. Take the precepts with the understanding that you're going to keep the precepts without breaking any of them. Why? Because when you keep your precepts without breaking them, your mind will naturally tend towards peace and tranquility. And when you start doing the meditation, your progress is very fast. Now, I've given you some, in the past uh, few talks, I've given you the reason that this is like that. Whenever you break a precept, you're interfering with a peaceful, calm, alert mind. Even some, something as trivial as a little white lie can affect you negatively. And it, it, you have to purify yourself from that before you're going to progress with your meditation. Now, I've been with students that it took a long time for them to understand what the meditation was about. I've had students for over 30 years that when they got off retreat, they went back to the way they were, breaking precepts and using foul language and things like that, breaking the precept of no alcohol. Now, there are some medicines that they have alcohol in them. Those are called medicines not uh, drinking alcohol to excess. So it, it clouds the way you think. 
I know that there are doctors that recommend as you get older to take a little, maybe uh, a half an ounce or an ounce of wine before you go to sleep and you sleep more soundly and that's considered medicine. But smoking a joint after uh, doing a retreat or any time, you're hurting yourself. Please, I want to warn you against doing that. So, um, Devadatta was never, he, he became a monk under the Buddha and he was from a family that had great merit. He was a Buddha's cousin but he was continually breaking precepts, especially with um, alcoholic drinks. And they had just as many drugs during the time of the Buddha as we do now. They give them different names now, but they still, they, they, they had roots that they say, if you take this root and you, you hold it in your mouth, you're going to be very happy. And uh, there are things like that, but they, they really cloud your mind. So it's best not to do that sort of thing. Okay, when a monk has gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor, and renown. He's not pleased with gain, honor, and renown and his intention is not fulfilled. He does not on account of it laud himself and disparage others. He does not become intoxicated with that gain, honor, and renown. He does not grow negligent and fall into negligence. Being diligent, he achieves the attainment of virtue keeping the precepts. This is something for monks, it's something that's done very early in their practice or before they even take on the practice. He is pleased with the attainment of virtue and his intention is fulfilled. On account of that, he lauds himself and disparages others. I'm virtuous, of good character, but these other monks are immoral, of e evil character. He becomes intoxicated with the attainment of virtue, grows negligent, falls into negligence, and being negligent, he lives in suffering. So even keeping your precepts without breaking them, you still can have a lot of suffering. Why? Because you haven't purified your mind enough. Suppose a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, came to a great tree standing possessed of heartwood. Passing over its heartwood, its sapwood, its inner bark, he would cut off the outer bark and take it away thinking it was heartwood. Then a man with good sight, seeing him, might say this good man did not know the heartwood and only went away taking the outer bark. Thus, while needing heartwood, he cut off the outer bark and took it away, thinking it was heartwood. Whatever it was this good man had to make with heartwood, his purpose will not be served. So too, monks, here some clansman goes forth out of faith, but still lives in suffering. This monk is called one who has taken the outer bark of the holy life and stopped short with that. 
a lot of people have an idea that all monks are um, they're, they're supposed to be very virtuous and the key word here is supposed to be but they still have a lot of stuff to go through they can still have their angers and their greeds and that sort of thing as they develop more and more then they are able to let go of those sort of things and become more virtuous all the time. But a lot of laymen, they, they put this label, he's a monk, how can he do something like that? Tell a lie or do something that's not really appropriate for the monks. So you have to understand that being a monk, the first five years that you become a monk, you're supposed to stay with your upachaya. And upachaya is a spiritual father. And he's going to train you over five years so that you can develop that uplifted mind all the time and you understand more and more what the Buddhist teaching is all about. And keeping the precepts, they, they know very well what all of that means. But if they don't stay for five years, then there's a wrong idea of their taking on the robes and there can be a lot of mistakes that are made. And they don't know as, as mistakes. One of the things that's happening in the Buddhist countries as foreigners start to go to these Buddhist countries and become monks is they just ordain the monks and let them go off on their own, do anything they want to do. So there's not this deep understanding of what a monk actually is and how much they need to spend time not only chanting, but visiting other monks and talking with them about Dhamma. So there's the wedding down of the Dhamma that's happening right now that's kind of dangerous. Now, this practice that I've, I've I've been giving you the six R's will purify your mind. And it will purify your mind so much that you can become a noble one. And the noble Sangha, it doesn't matter whether you have robes on or are you are a layman. <coughs> The way you join the Noble Sangha is by experiencing becoming at least a Sotapanna. Now, just because you become a Sotapanna doesn't mean that you automatically are going to be keeping the precepts all the time. You can still break a precept. But when you break a precept, you feel very, very guilty. And that guilty feeling is you know that you broke a precept and you want to purify your mind. Because if you break a precept and then you go sit in meditation, you're going to have a lot of hindrances come up. You need to purify your mind. And there's different ways of doing that. One, you go to a monk, if there's one available, and tell him that you broke a precept. And he will give you the precepts again with a strong determination not to do that again. That's one way of purifying your mind. So you don't have that guilty feeling of breaking a precept. 
excuse me. If there is no monk around that you can confess your your breaking of a precept, then you go to a spiritual friend, someone who truly understands the essence of keeping your your precepts very good while you are living your life. And you confess it to a friend. One of the reasons that hindrances arise is because in the past, in our, our recent past, or it could be past lifetimes, we broke precepts. As soon as you break a precept, you have a guilty mind. I shouldn't have done that. I had a lot of friends that, that were in wars and they actually killed someone. And they said that that guilty feeling never goes away. You look at life much differently after doing a heinous act like killing someone else. I highly recommend that they start with forgiveness of themselves. And when that person comes up in their mind, they look them straight in the eye and ask them to, them to forgive him. And he forgives himself for doing that act. And that's the only way that you can really purify your mind. Now, during the time of the Buddha, there was a monk. He, he was called Angulimala. And his teacher had told him that he had to go out and kill a thousand people and cut off one of their fingers to prove that he had done that. Now he wound up killing 999 people. And he was a scourge of a, a certain area in India. People were afraid to go into that forest because he was there and he got a big reputation for killing people. The Anguli Mala, Mala means necklace. Anguli is finger. So he was named Finger Necklace. When it got time to kill the 1,000th person to fulfill his teacher's uh, task, the teacher was not a very virtuous person. The Angulimala thought that he might, for his thousandth one, he would go out and kill his mother. Now, the Buddha saw that that was his intention, that he was going to go out and try to kill his mother. And he got in the way. He appeared right as Angulimala was planning the, the killing of his mother. And the Buddha started walking very slowly away. And Angulimala was running after him with the intention of killing him. But he couldn't catch up to the Buddha, who was walking very slowly, and he was running as fast as he could, and he never caught up with the Buddha. Finally, he stopped and he said, Monk, please stop. And the Buddha kept walking and turned and said to him, I already have stopped. 
And Angulimala said, but you're still walking. But the Buddha said, I have stopped letting craving dictate things that happen to me in my life. Oh, I, there, there's a big emphasis on craving. And everybody's supposed to know what craving is and how to recognize it. And to my shock and dismay, when I spent 12 years in Asia, I couldn't find one person that came up with the definition that really made sense for craving. It talks about craving, but it doesn't tell you what the definition is. And the, the Four Noble Truths, they talk about exactly how to recognize craving, know what it is, understand it, how to let it go, and take the path that leads to the cessation of the suffering, of craving. So Anguli stopped, Angulimala stopped walking and so did the Buddha. And then they started discussing Dhamma. And Angulimala saw the error of his ways and he um, eventually became a Sotapanna just by talking with the Buddha and getting his his mind more clear. And then he ordained and became a Buddhist monk. Now about that time, the King Pasanadi of Kosala was sending out an army and they were going to rid, rid the area of Angulimala. So he went to the Buddha first and started talking with him about the problems they were having with Angulimala and how he was killing so many people. And Angulimala was sitting in the group of Sangha that was listening to what King Kosala or King Pasanadi said. And the Buddha said, uh, what would you think if I told you that Angulimala is sitting in this room? and the hair on the back of King Pasanadi it stood on its end. And then the Buddha introduced him as this is the monk that was Angulimala. And he has given up his, his killing ways. So the king took the bounty off of Angulimala and allowed him to become be a monk. On Golimala, the, one of the things that happens when you're a monk in, in Asia at that time, all the monks went out on alms round to collect food for the day. Then they would come back and eat it. But Angulimala was re, was recognized as a uh, a killer. And people were very angry at him. And it says in the text that stray uh, rocks and stones and sticks would uh, hit him. And he'd come back with blood all over his head. And he kind of asked the Buddha if he could have the other monks go out on alms round and get food for him. And the Buddha said, no, you have to face this. Eventually, Angulimala became an arahat. 
and he's he's one of the uh, the group of eighty uh, special arahats. It's real interesting if you if you go to Burma. It's right by uh, Mingun Temple. There's another temple there that has uh, uh, marble statues of all eighty of the Maha Arahats. Maha means great or big. And Angulimala is there. I saw. I saw the, what the artist thought of him. It was carved out of marble, and he had really an angelic face. It really looked good. More more beautiful than a lot of the other ones. Anyway, so even. If anyone winds up killing, they have a guilty mind, or stealing, or wrong sexual activity, or telling lies and gossip, or taking drugs and alcohol, they feel guilty by doing that. And this guilty feeling is the cause of the wrong belief in a personal self. Every time you break a precept, it causes your mind to store up that wrong belief, I am that. And when you use the six R's, which is the Eightfold Path, you purify your mind from that guilty feeling and you finally let it go. And when you do, your mind becomes very clear and very bright and you start seeing things as they actually occur. Now, this seeing anatta in everything, the impersonal nature, means that you have a pure mind at that time. That is how you achieve the cessation of suffering. Because you're not taking anything personally anymore. You have more balance in your mind. You have more true understanding of how this process works. As we go along in this sutta, you'll see that there's different steps that monks go through. And this one monk that they're talking about, he was very satisfied when he, when he gained virtue and he didn't continue on. And that's like taking the outer bark of a tree that has heartwood in it. So he's not gaining as much as he would truly like to gain. So, here some clansmen goes forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, considering... I'm a victim of age, birth, aging, and death, of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. I'm a victim of suffering, prey to suffering, surely ending. An ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. When he's gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor, and renown. He's not pleased with gain, honor, and renown, and his intention is not fulfilled. Being diligent, he achieves the attainment of virtue. He's pleased with the attainment of virtue, but his intention is not fulfilled. He does not, on account of it, laud himself and disparage others. 
he does not become intoxicated with that attainment of virtue. He does not grow negligent and fall into negligence. Being negligent, he achieves the attainment of collectedness. He is pleased with the attainment of collectedness and his intention is fulfilled. Now, collectedness is a word that I substitute for concentration. The word concentration is way too misunderstood. As a result, I don't like to use it because then almost everybody that does a kind of concentration winds up putting an awful lot of energy into staying in that that state, but when they come out, their concentration fades and they have hindrances coming back and they haven't purified their mind of hindrances. Mind is pure while it's in the concentration state. But when the concentration diminishes, then the hindrances come back stronger than they, they would have if you hadn't meditated at all. So it's real important for you to realize that collectedness, there is stillness of mind, just like there is with concentration, although it's not as deep. Your mind is very composed, your mind is very alert, and you're able to see how hindrances arise and how to let them go by using the six R's. You see this over a period of time, and it's very important that you understand this, this difference between the kinds of meditation that there are. When I was in India this year, I was there for five months. I happened to meet an awful lot of people that had practiced Goenka style meditation, which was a one pointed concentration. And the Goenka style meditation had a tendency to bring up painful feelings in mind and body. And Goenka was very big on pushing them, pushing the students, so they would try harder. And the more they tried, the worse the pains became. Now the thing with pain is that there's a natural aversion to pain. It doesn't matter whether it's mental or physical. There is the aversion of that being there, and the more you keep your attention on that, the bigger and more intense that pain becomes. So when they came and started practicing with me and they started seeing that if you use the six R's properly and you don't have to sit on the floor with a, in a painful posture, you can sit in a chair and be comfortable, their progress in the meditation was very fast because they had developed that kind of concentration but they had to put in the six R's and a smile in their meditation. I get criticized a lot by a lot of different people because they are starting to go back into the suttas now and they say, well, where does it say that the Buddha said you had to smile? Well, if you look at a Buddha image, you see the artist is trying to show you that the Buddhas experience a kind of joy. It's called all-pervading joy. This kind of joy has a great deal of equanimity with it. 
but your mind is light. Anytime you try to push away a hindrance, to stop a hindrance from coming up, you keep your attention on that hindrance and it gets bigger and more intense. I know because I had 20 years of practice with doing exactly that. Straight Vipassana meditation tells you to note a hindrance until it goes away. Now that's not following what right effort is in the Eightfold Path. So when I would teach how to use the six R's, the uh, people that had been doing Goenka meditation, they would come shocked at, I didn't have any pain. Well, they were doing two things. In India, everybody th thinks that the only kind of meditation you can do is sitting on the floor. Oh, we've been sitting on the floor ever since we were little children. Fine but you're always moving around because pains start to come up and then you move so you don't feel the pain. So when people start to realize that you use right effort or harmonious practice, as I like to call it, that means one, you notice that there's something unwholesome that arose. There is a hindrance. It has tension and tightness in it. It pulls your attention away from your object of meditation. The second part of right effort is release. Don't keep your attention on the hindrance. As soon as you recognize that that hindrance is there, you don't keep your attention on it, you smile and you come back to your object of meditation. And that hindrance will go away very quickly. You relax. When that hindrance arose, it arose because craving was in it. I am that. I am this sadness. I am this feeling. I am this pain wherever it has to be. I am this itch. And I don't like it and I want it to change. I, 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 I. Taking as false belief in the personal self. So, now you relax and you let go of that distraction. You don't pay attention to it at all. That distraction doesn't necessarily go away by itself or go away completely. It might still be there depending on the amount of attachment you have on it. But you go through the six R's. You recognize, you release the distraction, you relax, you re-smile. Smiling is an important part of the practice. Why? The more you smile with the practice, the more you smile with your daily activities, the sharper your mindfulness becomes. You're able to see more and more clearly how these things arise. What happens first? What happens after that? What happens after that? And you start to recognize that this is a part of an impersonal process. You didn't ask that, that pain or sadness or guilt, whatever it happens to be, you didn't ask that to come up. It came up by itself. What you do with what arises in the present happens in the future. If you with what's happening right, which is what most of the Goenka people were doing, 
you can look forward to that pain coming up over and over and over again until you learn that's not the proper way to handle it. The proper way to handle it is by not keeping your attention on the hindrance. We don't care what the hindrance is. We don't even care where it came from. Doesn't matter. What you do with what arises in the present matters. If you fight with the hindrance, if you try to push it away, if you try to stop it from bothering you, you can look forward to having it come up over and over and over again. Or you can use the six R's and allow it to be there without keeping your attention on it and relax, letting go of the craving. The craving is the I like it, I don't like it mind. When there's pain arising, there's the I, I don't like it mind. And that is craving. As soon as you relax, then you smile and that improves your awareness so you can catch that movement of mind's attention more easily, more quickly. Now one of the things that Goenka did not like to have happen during his retreats and he didn't like anybody smiling in their retreat. I've had some students that they went to a Goenka retreat after they practiced with me and they were sitting there smiling. And they got war warned one time, you don't smile with this meditation. And the second time they get told, well, you have to leave, you're not following the directions. But the smile keeps your mind light. Keeps your mind very alert. The joy that comes up is a gentler kind of mind that is quite remarkable. Then you bring that pure mind that doesn't have any craving in it and your light mind which has joy in it, back to your object of meditation. And stay with your object of meditation as long as you can. So it's a real important aspect that you understand the craving and how to let it go. You understand the importance of the relaxed step. Now these, these students that were in India, one of the things that they said after the first day, I didn't experience any pain. And they were like shocked. And I said, well, no, you don't need pain. Pain is not your friend. I was told when I was doing straight vipassana, Pain is your friend. It's showing you where you have an attachment. Yeah, but they didn't tell me what to do with that attachment once I saw it. And I went through a lot of very intense pains. When I ran across this kind of meditation, I was completely enthusiastic about it because it didn't have, I didn't bring up any pains. The whole time I was doing the meditation, I had very severe headaches. When I was doing the walking meditation, oh, very big headache. When I was doing the sitting meditation, sometimes it would go away, but quite often I had a headache all the time. So when I started doing the six R's and that tension and tightness that was in my head didn't arise because I used the six R's, I became a real fan. I became very enthusiastic. 
so much so that I was going to sit for about a half an hour just trying this method out, the 6R method. And I wound up sitting for two hours because it was so comfortable. I didn't have that pain that was constantly intense with not only the physical process of it, but also the mental process of it. So there's a softening of the mind. Okay, I'm going to get back to this then. Suppose a man needing heart, wait, wait a minute. Okay. The, suppose a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, came to a great tree standing possessed of heartwood, passing over the heartwood and the sapwood. He cut out, he, he would cut off the inner bark and take it away thinking it was heartwood. Then a man with good eyesight, seeing him, might say this good man did not know the heartwood. He only took away the inner bark. And thinking it was the heartwood, whatever it was this good man had to make with heartwood, his purpose will not be served. So two monks here, some clansman goes forth out of faith and has a lot of suffering. This monk is called one who has taken the inner bark of the body of life, of, of the holy life, and stopped short after that. Here, monk, some clansman goes forth out of faith in the, from the home life into homelessness, considering I am a victim of birth, aging, death, and sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. I am a victim of suffering, prey to suffering. Surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. When he was gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor, and renown. He is not pleased with gain, honor, and renown, and his intention is not fulfilled. Being diligent, he achieves the, the attainment of virtue. He is pleased with the attainment of virtue, but his intention is not fulfilled. Being diligent, he achieves the attainment of collectedness. He is pleased with the attainment of collectedness, but his intention is not fulfilled. He does not, on account of that, lord himself and disparage others. He does not become intoxicated with that attainment of concentration. He does not grow negligent and fall into negligence. Being negligent, he achieves knowledge and vision. Now this means understanding. And this also means going through the jhanas because they're levels of understanding. Jhana does not mean concentration. It does not. Each time you go through a jhana, you are experiencing a different type of meditation because with each jhana there's different feelings and different things that arise while you're in that jhana. And you had to teach yourself how to go from one jhana to the next. Too many times people over-depend on, quote, a teacher. Too many times teachers 
are people that have experienced jhana in one stage or another and think they really know what the meditation is about without study. And that's a problem. To know what the Buddha is teaching and to truly understand it, first you do the meditation. That's why I tell people when they first come, I don't want you to read anything while you're on retreat. When you get home, after you have some direct experience, and probably 85 or 90 percent of the people that practice the uh, 10 day retreat with me, they will have experience of at least the fourth jhana and many, many more go much deeper than that. The fourth jhana is a very strong equanimity, balance of mind. And your understanding is such that you can pick up the Majjhima Nikaya, you read what the Majjhima Nikaya says, and you'll understand what it says. Because you have the knowledge and vision of the direct experience. So it's quite interesting that in only 10 days, because you are teaching yourself and you have progress, you truly understand what the Buddha was talking about. Now there's people that they would, they don't want to do meditation, but what they want to do is just study. They're, they're the more scholarly type person. But this kind of knowledge and vision that they gain just from the practice of study, the information that they have is too slow when you get to certain places in the meditation. You don't have, well, let's say you, you get to the fourth jhana. You don't personally understand what equanimity is, but intellectually you do. And eventually you'll figure out, well, this must be the fourth jhana. But when you're practicing the meditation, and a lot of people that come to me, on the third or fourth day of the retreat, do experience the fourth jhana. And this is a major step in the meditation. And this is where I get you off of loving kindness meditation and start teaching the Brahma Viharas to you and your progress in the meditation because your understanding of how this process works happens fairly quickly. Every retreat that I give if the people follow directions the way that I gave them without adding anything or try to say, no, I'm not going to do it this way. I want to do it the way I already know how to do it. Their progress is very slow. But as I said, when you follow the directions that's given, by the third or fourth day of the retreat, you'll be able to experience going into the fourth jhana where your mind has real balance in it. Your mind doesn't get excited, doesn't get so emotional with things. And your mind be becomes much more clear. And this is why the Buddha praised getting into this jhana. It's really quite an attainment. Now, when I was practicing straight vipassana, of course, we were told, don't ever do anything with jhana. That's only for developing your psychic abilities. 
And the fourth jhana doesn't have anything to do with the psychic abilities. They, it depends on the person's personality type, whether they're going to experience some psychic abilities or not. But getting into the, into the fourth jhana is really a major good thing. And this is where your true knowledge and vision occur. On account, he, uh, he is pleased with that knowledge and vision, and his intention is fulfilled. On, a, on account of it, he lauds himself and disparages others. I live knowing and seeing, but others, other monks, live unknowing and unseeing. He becomes intoxicated with that knowledge and vision, grows negligent, falls into negligent. In being negligent, he still lives in suffering. Now, I wrote a book called Life is Meditation, Meditation is Life, trying to get across the idea that meditation is living, not just sitting and quieting mind. Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves. And it can, it's moving all the time. And when you use the six R's, your mind becomes clear and you're able to see more clearly how mind's attention moves and how to let go of craving. So all of these things are kind of interconnected and it's important to understand that knowledge and vision is gained through doing the meditation without breaking a precept. Suppose a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, came to a great, great tree standing possessed of heartwood Passing over its heartwood, he would cut off the sapwood and take it away, thinking it was heartwood. Then a man with good sight, seeing him, might say, this good man did not know the heartwood and still is living, needing heartwood. He cut off its sapwood and took it away thinking it was heartwood. Whatever it was this good man had to make with heartwood, his purpose will not be uh, served. So here monks, some clansmen go forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, considering I'm a victim of birth, aging, and death, of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. I am a victim of suffering, prey to suffering. It's surely an ending of the whole mass of suffering can be known. When he has gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor, and renown. He is not pleased with the gain, honor, and renown and his intention is not fulfilled. When he is diligent, he achieves the attainment of virtue. He is pleased with the attainment of virtue, but his intention is not fulfilled. When he is diligent and he achieves the attainment of collectedness, he is pleased with the attainment of collectedness, but his intention is not fulfilled. When he is diligent and he achieves knowledge and vision, he is pleased with that knowledge and vision, but his intention is not fulfilled. He does not on account of it laud himself and disparage others.
he does not become intoxicated with the knowledge and vision. He does not grow negligent and fall into negligent. Being diligent, he attains perpetual liberation. And it is impossible for that monk to fall away from the perpetual deliverance. Now this is talking about getting into the noble sangha. The noble sangha is anyone that's become a sotapanna, a sakadagami, an anagami, or an arahat. These are called super mundane states. They're not states that ordinary people experience. Suppose a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, came to a great tree standing possessed of heartwood, cutting off only its heartwood. He would take it away knowing it was heartwood. Then a man with good eyesight seeing him might say, this good man knew the heartwood, the sapwood, the inner bark, the outer bark, and the leaves and twigs. Thus, while needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, he came to a great tree standing possessed of heartwood and cutting off only his heartwood, he took it away knowing it was heartwood. Whatever this good man had to make with heartwood, his purpose has, is well preserved. So too, here some clansmen go forth out of faith. Then he is diligent and attains perpetual liberation. And it is impossible for that monk to fall away from perpetual deliverance. Now, when you become a sotapanna, that's the lowest stage. That means that you're never going to have any doubt as to whether this practice works properly or not. No doubt. You know that rites and rituals will not lead to Nibbana doesn't mean you can't do the rites and rituals, but you know that it's not going to lead to Nibbana. Also, you're going to see the impersonal nature of everything more and more clearly. And you're going to understand it more and more deeply. And you're going to start to understand the links of dependent origination and how they actually work. Dependent origination is the backbone of the teaching and it's extremely important. So this holy life monks does not have gain, honor and renown for its benefit or the attainment of virtue for its benefit or the attainment of collectedness for its benefit, or knowledge and vision for its benefit. But it is this unshakable deliverance of mind that is the goal of the holy life, its heartwood and its end. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So this gives you a good progression of what you can expect for yourself when you practice the meditation. So, do you have any questions? It's on. Okay. Yes. Hi, Bonte. It's Elizabeth. How yes? are you? <laughs> Oh, very good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good. I had a question. Um, it seemed that in the sutta, um, these were very sincere people. These were, and, and the impression that I got in the sutta was how easy it is to be deceived, how easy it is 
to become intoxicated with something that you think is the goal to lose sight of it it was it was striking every time it was like wow it is a minefield yes it is <laughs> and one of the things one of the reasons that when you come and practice with me i don't tell you what jhana you're in until after you get past the fourth jhana is because you don't have that pride you don't have that uh interference of puffing up your chest and say well i'm at the second jhana or i'm at the third jhana i don't tell you what jhana you're in for that very reason when i was practicing straight vipassana there were still people that were practicing jhana practice and oh you were some kind of special person if you got into a jhana and they they would always walk around with their chest puffed up so i didn't like that so i i wouldn't tell people what jhana they were in and it doesn't really matter it matters to me what jhana you're in so i know how to tell you things but if you have a decent teacher he's not going to allow that to occur in you okay thank you bonte uh huh anybody else bonte hi yes. this is this is christoph i'm sofia's husband yeah and um i have a quick question about uh, craving you mentioned that craving is the i like it i don't like it mind does that mean that because we like something or don't like something that no, it's not quite like that oh okay <clears throat> when i say it's the i like it i don't like it mind i'm talking about feeling whatever feeling arises if it's a painful feeling i don't like it and i want it to stop if it's a pleasant feeling i like it and i want it to continue right now there is something that's called chanda chanda means wholesome desire now if you want to attain nibbana that's called chanda you point your mind in that direction and you don't get caught up in the i want any more you're just pointing your mind in the direction you want to go i want to attain nibbana some day that is chanda so and that's something that gets confused quite a bit okay uh it it seems that an awful lot of people try to be over particular with desire okay they don't understand desire so much i can make a determination which is chanda which is a wholesome desire to go into this jhana for a period of time that's a wholesome desire and that's not something that you're attached to it doesn't have craving in it it's just learning how to point your mind in that direction when you get to the place where you're practicing the six directions now that means a desire to put your point all beings in front of you and then all beings behind you and all beings to the right to the left above and below and then you put that chanda to work in all directions at the same time now that's desire but that's wholesome desire do you understand so yeah is okay. it and just to understand correctly if it's kind of the difference is one is chanda and the other one is the control freak right okay the wanting to control okay that's that's the 
the evil one of, of meditators. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, and it's easy to fall into, especially when you have a real pain in your backside or your arm or your leg and you just can't stand it. It's a real easy one to fall into mm -hmm. and move and uh, try to get rid of that pain. I I was just told uh, this week somebody from India called and told me that one of their students just found out they're in uh, the four the fourth stage of cancer and they were going to be dying very soon and they asked what can you what can I help them with so that they can die peacefully. And there is two things that I told them they had to do. One is start working on forgiveness. Forgive yourself for causing someone else pain. Forgive that, per that person for causing pain to you. And if you can do it in person, that's best. Or you can do it when you're sitting in meditation. The other thing that is extremely important, especially with people that have cancer, they have high acidity in their body in the blood. And what they need to do is take bicarbonate of soda, that's uh, baking soda, a spoonful in a glass of water in the morning, a spoonful in the glass of water in the evening. It doesn't have to be a full glass. It can be a half, half full. And this is an alkaline. Mm. And it, it takes away the food for the cancer. So that gives it a chance to overcome that problem. Now, I was just reading about it on the internet and they said that this is one of the reasons that pe very few people died of cancer before the 1700s was the reason was that the, they were giving them baking soda. Huh. And it overcomes that. So it's quite interesting. Nice. Uh, I had another student that uh, quite some years ago uh, she was on her deathbed. The doctor said in, within uh, six weeks to two months, she was going to be dead with cancer. And somebody took me to see her, and I, I did some chanting and that sort of thing for her. And she asked if there's anything that she could do. And I said, well, you need to forgive all the pains that you've gone through, the pain of the physical pain, forgive the pain for being there, forgive other people for causing you pain, forgive yourself for causing other people pain. And last year, now this was, uh, I think it was 2010 when I, when I saw her. I just saw her one time. I didn't know what was happening after that. Last year, she came and she donated this robe to me. Wow. <laughs> she was still alive. So the, the forgiveness and the baking soda is, is a very good combination. There's no guarantees that it's going to work, but it certainly can help. It can help have your mind be more at ease and accepting. So, thank you, Bante. Thank you. You're very welcome. Anybody else a question? Hello, Bante. Yes. So, I now have this question relating to meditation. So. How do you know if you've fallen half asleep or if you've entered one of the formless jhanas? 
Well, you're aware. Are you aware while you're half asleep? That's um, one of the signs of getting into neither perception or non-perception. But you will get into a place where there is nothing, absolutely nothing. There's no movement of mind's attention. Now you're taking mind as your object of meditation. And if you see your mind starting to come up with a thought, then you, you relax and come back to that quiet mind. Okay? Makes sense. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. So it's like uh, if you see that like, you have a thought forming or if you sense like some movement within your mind. Right. Then you, then you relax. And that's a, in essence what you're doing is the six R's. And it can happen automatically sometimes. Right. You relax and stay with the quiet mind. Sharpen your mindfulness. You should be sitting longer right now. If you have the time, three hours is a good amount of time to sit. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if you want to sit four, that's up to you. Right, but any less than three, uh, it, it takes a long time for the uh, purification of mind. But when you get up to three hours continually without moving, mm -hmm. that is very, very useful. Right. Thank you, Monty. Okay. And again, I want to remind everyone, if you're running across a place that you don't understand and you feel like you need to take a retreat, but you don't want to quit your job right now to do that, you don't have the vacation time, you can sign up for an online retreat. Now, the online retreat is you get up in the morning, you say the precepts, do a little ceremony, then you sit for an hour. During the day when you're back at your job, you relax and smile a lot. At lunchtime, if you have some time, then if you want to do a walking meditation, stay with your object of meditation while you're walking. When you get home, there is a questionnaire that David has developed where you tell us exactly what's happening with your meditation. We will answer it, and then we suggest that you listen to one of the Dhamma talks that we have selected. And if you have time before you go to bed and you're not too sleepy, sit for another hour. But smiling during the day is very important with your daily activities because that helps sharpen your mindfulness so that when you do the sitting, your mind is a lot more alert. And as I said, we get, we'll give you all of the answers we, uh, we can to help you after we find out what your practice is. It's very important that you fill out the questionnaire, okay? And we're, we're starting to have more and more people doing online retreat, especially with this virus that's around. If you feel like you want to just take the time and do that, instead of sitting home and twiddling your thumbs, you can do an online retreat. That would be very good. Okay? And say hello. Yes. I have a question. Yes. Related to these strange times, 
Um, my mum is 98 years old and in a care home about 15 miles, 15 minutes drive from here. But I've not been able to see her since February. And um, phone calls with her become ever more difficult as she, her mind unravels. Uh, I'm getting quite upset here now. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what I can do for her. Well, I, there's something I want everybody to understand. And that is, you are never hopeless. If you want to help spend time having her in your mind and radiating loving kindness to her, her mind will settle down. She won't be so excited. And it can help with memory sometimes. My mother was 93 when she died. The last six weeks of her, her being alive, I spent with her every day, sending loving and kind thoughts to her. On the day that she did die, there was a lot of family that was, we knew that it was getting close and a lot of family came and they were just sitting around in the room waiting for my mother to die. And I started radiating equanimity. So everybody had a balanced mind. Now these were all, uh, my family is very strongly Christian. And that's fine. I don't care what religion they are. They all felt the equanimity and they knew that I was, I was sending it to them. After she died, there was about 10 minutes that everybody was quiet. And then one of the relatives said, I don't know whether to smile and be glad or cry. And I said, well, now that she's gone, you don't have to worry about it. Whatever expression, the grief comes out for you. Accept the grief without pushing it away. So instead of thinking uh, and, and having uh, aversion thoughts to what's happening right now, Send loving and kind thoughts, not only to yourself, but to other members of the family. Everybody is feeling the same way you are. Yeah. So you send them loving and kind thoughts and their mind will start to be uh, more balanced and accepting. Thinking about your mother and her situation with aversion doesn't help anybody. No. <clears throat> so you radiate loving kindness to her. And I, I suggest this too. Take a, like a quart jar of clean water and hold it while you're sending loving and kind thoughts to your to your mother and your family members. And if you feel anything coming on, a cold, or you start feeling not as healthy as you could, start drinking that water. Water holds energy. They've, been, they've proved that a long time ago in, in Japan. And you're putting loving kindness back into your body and that makes everything more healthy. And I'll explain this too. Uh, when I was in Malaysia, there was a woman that was pregnant that she wanted me to uh, give her a blessing. And I, I, I took a bottle of water and I held it while I was doing the chanting, and then I was radiating loving kindness for about a half an hour, and I gave her that water, and I told her any time the, the baby in, in her body became over uh, anxious and, and moving around a lot, 
take some of that water and just massage the baby. And the baby would calm down very quickly after that. And when she finally had the baby, it came with very, it, I know there's a lot of pain in childbirth, but it wasn't as long as it had been with other uh, children that she'd had. It was fairly fast. It was only a few hours that she was in labor. And when the baby came out, the baby came out smiling. And it did really odd things. Now, I know a lot of babies, when, they, when they're born, the first six months or eight months, they're crying all the time. But she did weird things. This little girl would sleep all night without crying. And that was very amazing. And the first time I went to go see her, she saw me and she put her hands together like this. After that, it got real popular and a lot of pregnant women were coming and practicing with me and I gave them water. <laughs> So I, there was 27 or 30 different families that I call them my kids. They're, they're grown now, so that's, they were my kids because I gave them the water and it helped them to have a happier life, more accepting. So do that and send some water to her. Okay, thank you. And tell, tell her, take a sip every day. Now, if she starts to run out, wait till she gets about a quarter full of, of say, a, a quart jar, a pint jar, whatever, and put more distilled water in it and shake it 15 times. And that will re-energize all of that water so it doesn't run out. Okay? Okay. And that, that, that will help her mind be more peaceful and calm. And it will help your mind be more peaceful <laughs> and calm. That'll be good. Okay. Thank you, Bentley. You're welcome. Anything else? Hi, Bonte. Hey. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Good. How are you? Real good. It's good to see you. Yeah. Um, so I have a, actually a related question to Steve's question. Okay. Um, I've noticed, you know, popping up in, in the suttas occasionally the uh, – uh, parents are sort of placed in a special high regard um, in the in the Buddhist tradition, right? Um, and like I've I've read the the Sagalavada Sutta a couple times, and it talks about it there. Um, yeah, I was wondering if because you know this has come up in, in my life, especially because now I'm um, since the pandemic started, uh, I've been staying with my parents, um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of uh, what, um, what the responsibilities are to parents like from the Buddhist perspective or from your perspective? Well, from my perspective, the more love you can give them, the better. Okay. So every day, put, put aside 10 or 15 minutes and just radiate loving kindness to them wherever they happen to be. And there are times when parents have to be tough and you don't really understand it yourself and you start holding a grudge towards them. Forgive yourself for not understanding. Forgive them for not understanding. And there was a Russian man that his dialect of Russian, they didn't have the word forgiveness in it. So we came up with acceptance. Okay, everybody has a bad day every now and then, and they're gruff and they 
they've just gone through it. You don't understand what their problem was. So you have a tendency to take it personally and, and get mad at them and that sort of thing. So forgive yourself for that and forgive them. Also, laugh with them. Get them to laugh. Okay? It's real important. Have fun with your parents, even though your parents can be uh, strong with discipline and disappointed that you didn't follow their advice and all of that. If you forgive them for that. But don't take it personally. Don't take it as they hate me. They don't. They truly love you. They don't know how to express it sometimes. So you forgive them for not knowing. It's okay. One of the major mistakes that almost everybody has is they, when they're around adults, they think adults know everything. And geez, they're just like you, so you don't know everything, so why do you think they should know everything? Well, you can follow their advice if it seems good to follow, but don't argue with them about it. Okay? Send them loving kindness and send them forgiveness. That will make life much more easy for you. Okay? Okay, Ramante, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Okay, let's share okay. some merit. Uh, oh, yes, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I wanted to wait to see if there's no other questions and jump in because okay. uh, we have already asked one. Um, this is connected to the advice you gave to Steve about right. the holy water, the, right. the loving kindness water. Right. That seems to, um, licking his fur out of his skin to the extent that the skin is bare. And I was wondering if this, we could use this for helping our cats too. Yes, because, of course. You know, of course the, the doctor would give him medicine, but we can see that it's some sort of a mental. Um, I, I would take a little bit of water and put in his drinking water mm -hmm. and every day give him a massage. Him or her, I don't know which kind of. Him. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. uh, male cats especially love to get rubbed. Yes. So just take some, and while you're doing that, while you're touching him, give him loving kindness. Yes. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you bet. Every being wants the same thing. All beings want to be loved. So, our job is to oblige them and give it to them. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bante. Okay, anybody else? Bante, it's Elizabeth. I was just going to say that I have a, I have a two-year-old dog and um, he sits with me in my meditation room, and he has a special chair. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> and uh, he, um, all I have to do is, you know, put my finger to my mouth like, Shh. and I swear he loves to be in the room when I'm meditating. He Absolutely. goes into the deepest sleep. He, I'll, <laughs> I'll be meditating and I'll hear. And I'm like, and he's already been up. He's like, should be active. It's just, and I'm, and I'm not trying to be trite. He's very drawn and attracted to me when I'm sitting in meditation. Yeah, I, I'll tell you another dog story. I had a dog. He just appeared one day, and he was part pit bull and part um, 
um, Labrador. Smiley, yeah. He demanded to be in the room whenever I gave a Dhamma talk. And if we, I, I, he didn't show, show up and we closed the doors, he would sit, sit outside the door and start howling until you couldn't hear me talk, so we had to let him in. And he was very insistent about that. He, and he was right at my feet, and he, he would listen, and he really liked it. <laughs> And he was our protector dog. Now we're in the forest and we have some cabins up in the forest. And sometimes we have women that would come and we put them in one of those cabins. He would stay with them the whole time. They, he would get, uh, he would see that after the Dhamma talk, the woman would come out and go to her cabin. So he would stay right outside the door. If she got up during the night, had to go to the bathroom, he would be with her the whole time. And he would wait at the door until she got done and then walk back with her. And then at 5.30, she would come down for the uh, morning service he was right there with her the whole time. He knew that, that it was his job to take care of anybody that had any fear. He would be right there and help him. Wow. He was quite an amazing dog. And his name was Smiley? Smiley, yeah. I called him Smiley because the first time I met him, I, I started petting him and he started smiling. <laughs> I couldn't think of any other name for him. It's a beautiful. But he smile. had he had a great smile. He really did, and what very kind of very intelligent. Mm. Well, what kind of karma does a dog have to get to live with a, a Buddhist monk who is actually <laughs> living the Buddhist teachings? Well, they, that's good karma right there. That's good karma. Yeah. <laughs> And they gen the dogs generally, even if they've been mistreated, after a period of time, they mellow out. I was just telling you about Smiley. He was smart, except uh, he liked to chase cars with the wheels running, moving, and he got run over and died. He was reborn in uh, Tusita heaven. It's very unusual for an animal to be reborn into a heavenly realm. Very unusual. And some of the people there, they started seeing all of a sudden this black dog was running around. And he would he would sometimes come visit me and we had another black dog and i thought that black dog was right beside me and i put my hand down and i put my hand through him and then i'd turn and look look down and watch him run through the door so he came and visited for quite a while i haven't seen him for a long time now so he might have changed into a human being which happens. Wow, thank you for sharing that story. Those sure. Stories. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of animals around here. Um, I'm, I'm missing one, one that I haven't seen this year, and that, that's a groundhog. I saw him. You saw him? I saw him, yeah. Oh, where you going? A great, oh, good. Yeah, good well, I have to run outside. If, they're, they're great fun to be around. And they understand what you talk when you're talking to them. <laughs> they won't run away. They'll, they'll, they'll 
But if you get too close to them, then they'll start to turn around and go away. But I like walk, watching them run because they're real fat in the in the hind end and they kind of waddle. And it's, it's real fun to watch them. <laughs> so I'll, I'll have to go out and make friends with the new, new groundhog. So, is there any other questions? Okay, let's hear some merit now. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So you all have fun and have a good week. Thank you so much, Bhante. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. Oh, you. you're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. See you Wednesday. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, yeah, okay. Bye, everybody. David's my calendar. He, he <laughs> keeps up with these things. <laughs> Bye. Bye.